I'd like to call this meeting to order <clears throat> for the Blackhawk County Board of Supervisors for March 28th, 2023. Roll call, please, Mr. Veter. Hall. Here. Little. Here. Schwartz. Here. Trelka. Here. Leyland. Here. Would everyone please join us for a moment of silence as we reflect on our actions today? Thank you. Would you please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item one is the agenda received as proposed or as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Agenda is received. Item two is public comments. Is there anyone in the audience today that has something to comment on that is not on today's agenda? Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom that has something they'd like to say today during public comments? Hi. So my name is Danica Haas, and this is Courtney King. Hello. Hello. We both work at the Allen Child Protection Center, and I have been emailing back and forth with Linda about some pinwheels that um, we would like to display in the yard at the courthouse, if possible, for the month of April, which is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, and so we um, are on the call today just to see if there are any questions about that that we can answer or anything more that we need to do in order to um, get that approved for us to be able to do that. Certainly. Uh, yes, I was going to say, I asked her to join in public comments and thought mm -hmm. if we needed to put an action on for board action, we could do that next week. But if not, we just kind of move forward with having that done. I think it's fine. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And Rory did contact me this morning. I thought he'd be here already. He was going to suggest um, working with you, Danica, to do that and where the proper location would be. Um, and did think this morning, I mean, maybe you, the two of you, after you talk um, and have some conversation, will change thought on that. But he was thinking like the flower bed areas around the building, close to the building, but also um, not in the lawn, so we could do lawn care and those types of things in April because it's for the whole month of April. But to kind of be displayed as like a flower bed, if that works, if that sounds good to everybody. Okay. Anything else you want to share? Great. Would that be great? And I'll just put you in touch with Rory. I know. He's received the information that you've had and the board has as well. So that'd be great. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your help with all of this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on public comments that, uh, for public comments that's on Zoom? Seeing none, we'll move on to claims and payments. This is a resolution that the Board of Supervisors approve expenditures and that the county auditor be authorized and directed to issue checks against the various settlement of such claims as allowed. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Michelle. Good morning, board. Good morning. We have a nice low payment this week. Um, our total payment is $134,880.87. And of that, we have $2,565.10 from the 6040 fund. I believe everything is in order for that today. Great. It's been moved and seconded. If there are no other questions, please answer as your name is called. Hall. Yes. Little? Yes. Schwartz? Mm -hmm. Yes. Velka? Yes. Leyland? Yes. Item four, presentations. The Gilbertville Emergency Services Building with Mayor Tomey here, as well as other guests. So I'll let you start off, Mayor. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for you guys' time this morning. I have uh, Scott Becker. He's Councilman Mayor Pro Tem. And Jeff Frost is also on the City Council for Gilbertville. Um, we've had a long little project here trying to get us a new public safety building for our fire and our police and uh, we uh, have some information we'd like to present and ask if uh, the supervisors or the county would be able to help us out with that so uh, again we appreciate your time and you're lucky enough to have Scott do most of the talking and not myself this morning so thank you thank you Mark <laughs> Apologize. I wish I would have known that uh, we could have presented their PowerPoint, but uh, that's my fault for not checking. But a little PowerPoint presentation with some information and general 
what's going on within the, like Mark said, our project. Uh, Thank you. We've been looking to replace our aging 80 plus year old fire station for several years. It's an old implement dealer converted to a automobile repair shop, gas station to a fire station about 60 years ago. Um, the problem is the building's too short. We have to special order our fire trucks. Last time it cost us $80,000 extra to get it short enough in the building. It's very tight, it's very cramped. We've added on to it. We've bought additional property. It's just really not accessible and, and presents a lot of challenges, especially when we've got events at the school and the church parking has become a, a major problem. Uh, the only viable option we come up with is to replace the facility. The fire department's been fundraising for over eight years. Um, Firefighter Association has already purchased the land uh, for the building. Uh, we've been working with Intercog um, to help with our, the project as well. Um, we got a very strong volunteer fire department. In fact, our numbers are growing, which is kind of bucking the trend around the county and the state and everything, you know, the volunteer fire department. We've got a good bunch of people to help out. Very, very fortunate to have that and a strong group that are committed to help. So once again, we, we think we've got a good group of people. A couple little next page here is some information that's kind of general, what's going on. We cover 69 square miles within Blackhawk County. Um, we cover Northern Cedar Township, Southern Pointer, and Western part of Fox Township. Um, basically, we go from Shawless Road up here behind Birch Cabinets, Cedar Terrace, Silver Lake Drive, all the way over to Dysart Road, south to the county park uh, between Laporte City and, and uh, Washburn. And we cover, the, that's on the west side of the river and east side of the river. We cover uh, up to Dubuque Road, um, which is uh, you know south of Raymond. We get into Raymar and across, and we've got both the mixed mass master of 380 and, and 20. And then we also cover all the way down to the hideaway cabin south between Giverville and Laporte City. So we got, and then west, east, excuse me, to Oxley Road. So we've got quite the uh, area that we cover. Um, so this covers the city of Gilbertville, part of Cedar Terrace and South Waterloo, unincorporated Blackhawk County, kind of including Washburn and the Raymar area. Um, Gilbertville Fire and Rescue it also has, we have river, um, Coverage that we provide, we got 20 miles of interstate and uh, 380 and US 20 we cover. We do have a lot of uh, high pressure underground pipelines. So a lot of our calls actually get out on the interstate. We have a lot of calls. We have some river calls every year. Um, in fact, we don't have enough room. We park our boat at one of the firefighters' house because we don't have enough room to park our boat into the, the building we have today. So another reason why we want to uh, build this new building, just to give us a little more Quick response time. Um, the next slide is the actual our coverage area, kind of show you where we cover um, quite a bit, to, like I said. And then we offer mutual aid between Gilbertville, everything between Gilbertville and Laporte, obviously they call us, we help them. Wash and out that direction, we get to help Waterloo and Hudson on occasion, mutual aid with Raymond and Jessup as well. So we do have quite a few calls, about 18 fire calls um, for mutual aid across the last 2022. Next slide is about our population. So we got, per the last census, we got 2,861 residents in our area that we cover. 28% are in the city of Gilberville and the rest of the 72% in rural Blackhawk County. The amount of fire calls that we had in 2022 was 65. Two were within the city of Gilberville, 51 were within rural Blackhawk County, and the other 12 were mutual aid calls within the county as well. Once again, we cover help with Laporte, Raymond, Jessup, Hudson, and occasionally we've helped with Waterloo. Medical calls. Uh, we have a first responders. We do not have an ambulance. That's part of our plan going forward. We'd like to get our own ambulance service, but today we uh, work with Evansdale. And uh, of the 121 calls we had, 39 were in Giverville, and the other 82 were in the part of the area that we cover. Support for our project. We do have a grant from the USDA. Um, Congresswoman Henson's office helped us get a half a million dollar grant. Um, and I can provide these letters if you would like. Um, we've also got uh, letters of support when we started this project a year ago with working with the, uh, the federal grant um, from the Blackhawk County Sheriff. Tony helped us out, EMS, some of the elected officials, our state legislator, our state senator, some of the supervisors, letters of support churches, school, business leaders, and we've got other citizens and emergency service agencies that also were supportive of our project. We just did a bond issue in Gilberville because we knew we were not gonna have enough money to do this project without that. And we had an 87% of the citizens voted to support the project. So that was quite the uh, 
impressive uh, support for the project, even though they know it's going to raise their taxes. Um, There's still big support. <clears throat> and we just had our last fundraiser. $50,000 was raised at the event. Um, we'll continue to do that going forward, as we know that we're going to have to have other needs um, besides just the building itself to keep our fire department uh, in, uh, in ready to be available to help everybody out. Uh, the reasons we're asking for requests from you guys is we have minimal bonding capacity due to previous infrastructure commitments. We've already updated our water tower, our new well, a well house. We've updated our water mains in the last 10 to 15 years. We also were on the forefront. We have our sewer plant done, completed, meets all the DNR codes. Uh, we're able to do that with GO bonds and revenue bonds. So we haven't had to ask for any extra help from that. Um, you know, basically, we provide most of our service to the residents of Blackhawk County, not within the city. Um, we're an, unable to tax the townships any additional funds. That's set by the state of Iowa, the amount of money that we can tax them. We max that out just doing our normal $95,000 budget. The amount of money that we get from the townships is maxed out with the $95,000 budget that we have for total. And that does include like a vehicle set aside. FYI, our police department budget is about $97,000 for the year. Everything's volunteer, fire department, police department's all uh, part-time. But uh, once again, we're, we're locked in. We can't get any additional funds from the townships. We've asked for state grants, and they're really good to help buy fire equipment and fire trucks, but they do not help at all with buildings. So it's kind of a, kind of a bad little double-edged sword there. They help us out to buy the equipment, but no place to put it. So. Once again, the next slide is uh, kind of showing our tight constraints that we have. Uh, our location, once again, is just uh, across the bridge and, and in town. Our new site is going to be just north of Casey's. If you guys are familiar with Gilbertville at all, if you come in from Raymond, um, right by the Casey's, the local uh, farmer there was a former volunteer fire department member and graciously offered to sell us some land uh, to build our building on. He had other offers, but he was not going to let anybody have it besides uh, for the fire department. So let's see, we got room, we got tight issues, we've got height issues, we've got like we can't even get on top of the trucks to work on them. We have about a foot and a half clearance in our ceiling. Um, so it's really tight and we really need a new facility. Um, the building plan for the, for the building, we've been working with the volunteer fire department with the architects is on a functionally yet fiscally responsible building. Pre-COVID, the information that we had and the people we were working with gave us an estimate of about $1.6 million. Come to find out post that we could not go with a post wood frame building. We had to go with the steel structure building, which basically almost doubled the cost of the building and everything else going on with the COVID related. So the current estimate is just short of $3 million, which is much higher than originally had planned. But uh, we're still going forward with the project the best we can. Like I said, everything we can do. Um, the grant from Ashley Hinson office helped with the project. Um, we would have requested more if we knew that the cost was going to be double, but uh, that's just what we're tied in. That's what we're kind of tied into. Timing is an issue. We have a certain timeline that we have to use those grant funds, so we're, you know that's why we're pushing forward with this. Um, and next slide is just a, a plan for the building with a with a <coughs> little view of what's going on. Um, kind of layout of six bays. We're going to have a police uh, area with a. Uh, interrogation room and evidence storage which is sorely needed in our current building and an apparatus bay that we will fill all of them up between our pumper trucks um, boat rescue vehicles and everything else that we have all right jeff would you pass out the other next attachment is our preliminary report from our architecture from martin garden and associates this is just the details of the project, the need, the site, uh, all the details on that. And there's a cost estimate in the third page of that and shows that $2.961 million is what the, the cost estimate is as of today. We have not taken it out for bid. We're still waiting on some uh, funding and some other type of requirements. There's also a drawing, a little more detailed drawing of the building in those four pages. And down to the last thing, the sources of funds, and here's what why we're here to see what you guys meet. Um, 2.9 estimated cost. We've got $400,000 that we've fundraised already. The city has set aside $175,000 of our funds. We have the grant, the USDA grant from the federal government for half a million dollars. We have the Blackhawk County Game Association. Um, we have half a million dollar request in for them. 
We'll know that in the next about 40 days. We have a grant applied from grant from Inter-American Energy and then Farmer State Bank. That leaves us with about $1.25 million shortfall. We are asking um, the county if we could uh, receive $600,000, half of our shortfall. The city of Gerville with our GL bonds would cover the other half with $625,000 and kind of split the difference. Um, we have one thing, the source of funds we do not have on there is we will be selling our current fire station, but we're kind of keeping that as our back pocket and just in case something happens. We've got to have a little cushion in the whole project, but we're not anticipating more than $50,000 of income from that. So it's not as a big deal, but that is, uh, you know, before somebody asks, that's one of the options that we have to help with our project. I guess I'd like to just remind everybody, you know, 95% of our territories within the county, 72% of the residents, 97% of our fire calls and 68% of our first responder calls is outside the city of Gilbertville. Um, we appreciate anything that you guys could help us out to do. Um, it's kind of our request. Um, anything that, uh, any other suggestions for us from a uh, fundraising opportunity we're more than willing to listen to, um, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present to you guys and uh, any questions for myself or Mark or Jeff that you guys have about this project? Could you just speak a little bit to the, you, you had referenced the timeline with the uh, federal grant. Can you talk just a little bit more on that? Once again, uh, Isaiah Corbin with Intercog has been okay. helping with that and he's been working on that project for us. So the federal grant is through the community funded projects. Uh, basically, that's written into the federal spending bill, so you have a year to spend it. So, um, you got to get it spent by the end of the year. The end of this year, calendar year. Yes. Yeah. So that's through uh, Ashley Henson's office. She promoted that, got it on the bill, um, went through the bill making process. So you you get a year after you're told that you're funded. Um, so the bill passed in January. So we have until the end of the year to spend it. Can that be phased in? Are there any part of the project that it could be utilized for? Just thinking that we won't hit that goal probably by this year. Yeah, I mean, so it's an interesting program in that you still, you're basically funded, but you still have to go through USDA requirements through their community facilities program. So you have to still meet their standards up to that point. Um, so some of it, yeah, they could probably phase, you know, some of the, you know, minor things, but all in all, you have to complete the project, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from our standpoint, we're, um, our timeline is we just got the bond referendum passed. We would have done that sooner, but we found out we had to take it to a vote. So that just happened here in March. So from a timeline standpoint, if we, decide we're going fully forward, we'll probably be doing bids in June and help, helping to start project in sep August, September, dirt work and ground and, and start building. Um, that's kind of the, the plan that we have in, in place if everything falls in. Any type of valuation that's been done on the current facility too, as far as, uh, no, not, no, not, not really. It's, 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 it's a, it's best for storage or, you know, it's a small office in there. There's really not, it's someone wants I think the best bet somebody's going to park their cars or something in there for, uh, for utility or for vehicles or whatever. The city doesn't need it, but uh, somebody will want it for that standpoint. So it sounds like you have a timeline at least going forward. Right, so right. That's, that's the plan, correct. Are there other federal grant dollars that you all have applied for or are on the horizon? Not that we're aware of. We've been okay. looking. Like I said, we've been partnering with Intercog, anybody that we can find. But yeah. there's, there's, like I said, there's a lot of grants out there to buy vehicles, but not to build the facility itself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Are there any other questions? I was going to say I appreciate the information and providing it to. There might be more questions, obviously. Yes. If we it's suggestions if you have anything call city hall do the through marker get a hold of myself or marker isaiah intercog we'd be more than willing to answer any other questions or concerns or any other details that you would like like i said you would like the letters or a breakdown of our budgets we could sure give you any of that information as well right it's a lot of good information so thank mm -hmm. you you guys got anything else all right well thank you appreciate you guys time and hopefully we can uh, work together on this project thank you thank you thank you, thank you.
Moving on to item five, receive project updates from department heads and elected officials. Good morning, board. Kathy Nicholas, county engineer. Good morning. A brief update. The gravel roads still do have some potholes in them. We are out uh, placing spot rock and ablating this week. It looks to be good weather for that. Construction season starts here in Black Hawk County today. Our Pointy Road, Pointy Road will be closing uh, today, this morning, and that is to replace our Pointy Road Bridge. That will uh, begin today. Taylor is moving in to start that work. It, and Taylor will be moving in on the bridge just east of Gilbertville, so between Gilbertville and essentially 380 or Canfield Road, that's where the uh, the closure is taking place. We have uh, placed signs. There are detour routes. There are signing on the interstate. And I felt this would be a good time to remind all drivers that uh, work zones safety is, is paramount to us. Drivers need to slow down. They need to pay attention. They need to turn off their phones or put their phones down as they're traveling through work zones. Work zones can be uh, very dangerous places at times. Uh, last week in Maryland, unfortunately, six construction workers were killed in a single errant vehicle uh, run off the road through in a work zone. So six workers killed in one incident, one single work zone fat fatalities. I just like to remind everybody that these people are our friends, neighbors, coworkers. Uh, we need them to come home at the end of the day. So again, I want to urge all drivers to slow down in our work zones, whether they're DOT work zones or Black Hawk County work zones or you know a city work zone. They're, they all look the same to drivers. So again, cautions should be um, taken. I also want uh, to say that Griffin Kabalka will presenting on roadside vegetation this morning, so come on up, Griffin. Morning, board. Morning. Morning. Uh, just here this morning to give a little update on kind of what we've been doing so far since I've been here. Um, and kind of what we're going to be doing this spring and summer. So as of um, fall of 22 and spring so far, we've um, reconstructed seven acres of native prairie along our roadways. Um, as you can see in the pictures below, um, this is the Lincoln Road Bridge in the bottom um, that was completed this past fall and was about an acre to an acre and a quarter of native prairie that was reestablished mm -hmm. and then um, this is off of Holmes Road um, just east of uh, Hudson and that was right at an acre of that whole stretch um, was reconstructed. Um, there's various sites around the county so if you see either a bare ditch or something that's green like that um, that's what's been so far this year um, planted. as we move to the spring and summer um, objectives um, this year we're looking to um, start to control uh, native or non-native uh, plants in the northwest quarter of the county um, from there um, we're going to use various tactics from spraying and um, doing some um, brush removal with uh, chainsaw equipment and other heavy heavy equipment that we can get in there with the uh, skid steer. Um, basically, as well as um, with those new seedings, they need some attention. Um, the weed pressure um, can be pretty detrimental if we don't keep on top of it. Um, it'll shade out the, the native plants as they're growing, and so maintenance mowings are a big key factor in establishing prairies. And as I mentioned, we'll do um, tree and brush removal in the northeast quarter. So as we spray um, each quarter, we're going to cut ahead of the spraying cycle. So that way the next year when the um, those trees re-sprout, we can spray them when they're at a small and manageable age. And then um, once the new um, fiscal year and budget is, is up to date, we are going to move forward with getting the new equipment. 
So here's just a map of the quadrants of the, the county. Um, obviously, I picked the northwest corner just because along the river there, there's quite a bit of brush, and um, that's the main focus in that area. Um, we did hire a summer intern um, this past couple weeks ago. Um, his start date will be at the end of May, on the 22nd, and his summer duties will basically be shadowing me and following me with herbicide spraying, maintenance mowings, um, doing native seeding plantings, and also working on some GIS mapping. Um, he has various skills with, with all of that, so it'll be great to have another person and also um, help teach him as well for his future in the natural resource area. And some odds and ends, um, I have obtained my CDL and pesticide applicators license and I have also this uh, winter worked with conservation and Brad Metcalf on building a countywide prescribed burn plan and policy. Um, the policy is going to take some time yet, um, but I think we're pretty close on getting the burn plan that we're both going to use for the county um, finished. And then, do you have any questions for me? I do have, I was going to also say, um, before we get into that uh, we Commissioner's resolution, if there's any other questions that you had on the resolution or not. What equipment did we, we I know we're getting <laughs> equipment. Yes. Uh, we're getting a larger tractor. <clears throat> um, so that, that would be part of the secondary, like the um, Wayne's section of it. Um, for getting that larger tractor with uh, a newer brush mower. Um, that will be utilized um, primarily with the secondary roads, not necessarily IRVM, but it will be a tool that will help manage things that the IRVM does. When do we plan to acquire that approximately? Any idea? Right. Yeah. I think you'll, you were having a truck, I believe, to help you as far as get out and do some of the work that you've been doing without? Yes, yeah, so currently, you know, we all have a um, smaller spray tanks um, with that bigger truck and uh, spray equipment. We'll be able to be more efficient and um, more active around the county and um, be able to spray larger quantities in one day. Um, and that will help so much just because, you know, the time of day and um, weather and wind in the summer, we all know, is pretty variable. So being able to get out there and really hit it hard um, while the weather is favorable for spraying conditions is going to be extremely more, a lot more efficient and just beneficial to the county. Does most of the seeding happen in the fall? <laughs> yes, yeah, so right. most of the seeding happens in the fall when we do our so you have um, the winter, fall, cold fall period. ditch cleanings. Yep. Yes, um, and I like seeding in the fall or early spring here, like February, March, just because the dormancy of that seed, you know, some of those uh, flowers need that freeze-thaw period to break mm -hmm. the seed coat, so then we get uh, earlier germination of those plants and we're not just waiting over time to utilize other management tactics. Mm -hmm. So we'll use Mother Nature and, and her abilities to help us save money in, in the long run too. And you did say that seven acres had been planted this spring, correct? Um, was that, that, was, that was this last fall that was in last the spring, fall. yeah. Okay. I was yeah. Um, it, since last year, um, the crops didn't get out near as early as they would hoped. Um, our ditch cleanouts were held to a minimum. Uh, I think Wayne said that this was the least amount they've ever done in one year. So mm -hmm. usually they do about twice as much as that. So, you know, roughly looking at, I think they said, 15 to 20 miles worth usually and this year we only did like 7 to 10 so it really wasn't um, as much as we used to do so thank you mm -hmm. that. any other questions thank you thank, thank you, you. <coughs> any other project updates from department heads or elected officials I have a quick one about ARPA. 
Um, so people have been asking how we're doing on using our ARPA funds. So the committee has, we've been tracking it, but it's kind of a hard animal to get your arms around. The applications come in with pretty early estimates and they get refined, but um, I did send out an updated worksheet that tries to summarize that to you this morning. We have our total requests now are probably 24 million or so of the 25.4 million that the county was allocated. We actually have, um, we had talked about trying to separate the loss the replacement revenue allocation from the category specific expense. We now have total applications that are well in excess of our category specific expense. That was 15, the allocation was 15.5 million and we have applications requested of 23.3 million at this time. So that would mean we would, if we chose, if you chose to fund all of them, then we would have to be using the replacement revenue allocation um, for those projects as well. So our current balance that does not have any kind of application tied to it today is about 1.3 million. So we are starting to make some progress on that. And the, uh, the kind of interesting thing to see is we've touched nearly every county department has a benefit and probably indirectly every county department does because of some of the things we were allowed to do through information technology. <laughs> but even direct projects are reaching out to everyone in the county. So Michelle, we received a, a distribution in July of 2021 of about 13 million. Then we got another distribution in August of 2022 of about another 13 million. As that money sits in a fund, does it accrue interest? It is, and that is going to the general fund, so it's reducing property taxes. If you remember, we talked about during the budget, mm -hmm. um, our interest revenue was increased, partly due to rate increases, partly due to this additional cash available. And what about the, just for the public's knowledge, the, the amount that of projects that have received like final approval, not, not the ones with just applications, but stuff that the board has given final approval of? We are, that's about 10 million right now mm -hmm. that is in that category. Um, and a large portion of that is for conservation. We have the Cedar Valley Nature Trail and other several playgrounds and shower house facilities. We're, we are really upgrading a lot of things that our citizens will be able to enjoy um, and use. Are we still planning on an April work session? I think so. As far as should. everyone was like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure that was still on everybody's radar. To dig into a little bit more of this and some of the costs for some of those projects were kind of soft costs at this point too so we need to start yeah and we, we had talked about wanting to preserve a portion of funding for cost overruns because those are so common during construction mm -hmm. so that 1.3 million that's left does not give us a lot of cushion for those kinds of things now there are a couple projects on hold <laughs> And I'm just looking at the list here, but I yes. advanced past them. I'm wondering, and they tie up quite a bit of money, like one ties up 1.5 million. And I don't know if that project is going to proceed, so I wonder if projects like that we should just remove from the list. Well, that's, yeah, I have thought about that as well, mm -hmm. that we probably may be in the next week or so, maybe, or maybe we want to do it at the ARPA work session, or maybe we want to do it before, but to take some action on some of those and see, yes, where the board falls and at least giving everybody, I think, some mm -hmm. decision on that as well, because some of those have been in a while. Thoughts? I mean, I think the, the work session is a good time. It's, it's weird looking for the first half of April rather than yeah. the last half, but. Mm -hmm. the sooner the better, yeah. yeah. Maybe we can move that up to the 11th. We'll, the 11th. we'll see what okay. we can we get talked done. about the 18th, I think, and then, and then but you've got that's close enough to the first 11th. half. <laughs> the 18th is okay. We've we've gotten we've gotten some more of this work done, so we might be maybe as you get closer. Like Save says, we're going to be at the first. If it starts looking like the 11th, we can plan on that. But otherwise, the 18th. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to do a department update? Oh, sorry, one more in the room. Thank you. Bill, oh, go ahead. I'll wait. 
<laughs> Yolando? Oh. And he is there. Well, that's all right. No, it was. He might. There? There he is. Yeah, there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm here, but uh, I didn't have anything for a project update. I'm just here for the um, for participating in uh, listening to uh, later on in the agenda in that standpoint when we get into receive um, some of the other projects that uh, are there. I apologize for not being in person, but we had an eight o'clock walk in that I had to deal with. So I'm still here, though. No, that's fine. Appreciate that. Got the shelter. Okay, my turn. Yes. TJ Koenigsfeld, uh, Assessor, letting everybody know we are mailing out valuation notices here, um, probably probably dropping the mail early next week is my assumption. There's going to be some sizable increases, everyone should be aware that, um, you know, market's up and uh, we're supposed to be at market value, so I assume there will be some people that are going to call and, um, you know, may, may not be very happy. Send them to our office. We'll show them what we did and why and, and go from there. Um, it's important to note, it, note, though, too, that larger increases in assessed value, such as the residential and agricultural, doesn't necessarily mean large tax increases because there's a rollback to help offset inflation. So, <coughs> But, you know, watching the news last night, I saw Lynn County assessor, and first thing was property taxes going up. Well, we, we don't even know the, uh, the numbers yet, so... You know, that's just a good headline, though. So, anyway, I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on that. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Yeah, we'll send all the calls to you. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to do that. You want to give your cell phone number real quick? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other updates? Moving on to the minutes approved for March 21st, 2023. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Minutes are approved. Item seven, the consent agenda. The following items will be acted upon on a single resolution without separate discussion unless someone wishes to have someone remove something removed for discussion. So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Please answer as your name is called. <coughs> Little. Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Velka? Yes. Hall? Yes. Aylin? Yes. Item 8, proclamations. This is a resolution to proclaim the month of April as sexual assault awareness. <coughs> so moved. Second. I moved and seconded. Is there someone in the audience or on Zoom that wishes to speak to this? I believe someone was supposed to be. Oh. I'm an advocate Sir, would you please come up to the podium and give your name and address and... Anything you'd like to say? My name is Michelle. I'm an advocate with Riverview Center, um, and I'm here to request um, that Black Hawk County uh, recognizes uh, April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Is there any questions about Riverview Center, anything that we do um, that I can answer for you guys? No, do you have the resolution or grant? Is that something you wish you have even as a two day? <laughs> Sorry. I haven't looked. Yes, there is a proclamation. Would you like me to read it? Yes, please. please. Whereas sexual assault affects women, children, and men of all racial, cult cultural, and economic backgrounds, and whereas in addition to the immediate physical and emotional cost, <coughs> sexual assault may also have associated consequences of post traumatic, traumatic stress disorder substance abuse, depression, homelessness, eating disorders, and suicide, and whereas sexual assault can be devastating not only to the survivor, but also for the family, friends, and community of the survivor, and whereas since no one person, organization, agency, or community can eliminate sexual assault on their own, we must work together to educate our entire population about what can be done to prevent sexual assault, support survivors and their significant others, and support those agencies providing services to survivors. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Supervisors in and for Black Hawk County, on behalf of all staff and citizens of Black Hawk County, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in Waterloo, Iowa, and encourage all citizens to learn more about preventing sexual violence. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments? Oh, I just think we're 
Riverview Center for all that you do for our community. It's really important work. Thank you. I think we've come a, I know we've come a long way in 30 years, but we've got further to go. Remember as a young deputy taking a call in Colorado of a young man who was sexually assaulted at <laughs> a oil well site, uh, and he reported it, and he just reported it as, as, a, as a simple assault. And uh, I explained to him, well, this was a sexual assault. And I think now there's more awareness. That it was a hazing incident of oil well workers. And uh, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. Well, it's been motioned and seconded. Please answer as your name is called. Schwartz? Yes. Elka? Yes. Hall? Yes. Little? Yes. Layden? Yes. Item B is a resolution to proclaim the week of April 3rd, 2023 as National Public Health Week. So moved. Second. <laughs> moved and seconded. If someone in the audience wishes to speak. <laughs> Good morning, board. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jenna Deep House. I have served as the Environmental Health Supervisor for Black Hawk County Public Health for the past two years. I get the honor of speaking about our plans for Public Health Week this year. Um, the national theme this year is Centering and Celebrating Culture and Health. The theme was chosen so that everyone knows that they can make their communities healthier, safer, and stronger when we support and stay engaged with one another. Locally, we have adopted the theme Celebrate Culture, Celebrate Health. We will be using this theme at all of our summer events. I think it's really fitting considering the diversity that we do have in this county will give us a chance to celebrate the populations that we serve. We will use this week to highlight the work our staff does, especially our community health workers who work to bridge the public health services to our communities with language barriers. <coughs> um, the activities will begin on April 3rd with a staff celebration and continue um, on April 5th with a reception for community organizations which the board should have received an invitation to. This event will highlight community collaboration with community health workers and navigators, both the ones from Black Hawk County Public Health and health partners and organizations. We will discuss the equity work being done by the department, as well as brainstorm on continued ways to reduce barriers and further work together. <coughs> community outreach events that will be occurring during this week include a health fair at the Hawkeye Adult Learning Center on April 4th. And we will also be hosting a public health information booth at Tyson on April 6th. Throughout the week, we will have different social media posts highlighting the national themes for each day, as well as the work done locally. And I believe Grant has the proclamation. Yes, it's. Yes, you would. <laughs> no, it's good. I'm warning you, it's a page and a half long. Oh, all right. You want to hear it all? Well, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I'm, is there a portion of it at the beginning or at the end? <laughs> there's there's a like, lot of whereas. A lot of whereas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> want me to read it real fast? Sure. Okay. Whereas the week of April 3rd, 2023, is National Public Health Week, whereas the theme adopted by the Icock County Public Health for National Public Health, health Week is celebrate culture, celebrate health, whereas the goal of National Public Health Week is to recognize the contributions of public health in improving the health of the people of the United States and working toward health equity, whereas public health organizations use National Public Health Week to educate public policymakers and public health professionals on issues that are important to improving the health of the people of the United States, Whereas a strong public health workforce means that public health can make sure food and water are safe, track diseases, stop outbreaks, prepare for public health emergencies, provide health and maternal health care, and monitor data essential to public health. Whereas each 10% increase in local public health spending contributes to uh, a number of things that I'll skip over. Whereas racial and ethnic minority populations continue to experience disparities in the burden of illness and death in Black Hawk County Public Health works to ensure that people in our community have equitable opportunities and resources to lead healthier, more fulfilling, and longer lives. Whereas vaccinations is one of the most significant public health achievements and has resulted in substantial decrease in the number of cases. Whereas public health encourages communities across the United States to change the way they care for their health by avoiding tobacco use, eating healthier, etc. 
whereas studies show that small strategic investments in disease prevention can result in significant savings in health care costs, whereas access to pediatric oral health care is at a crisis point, with Blackhawk County being the number one county in the state for childhood teeth, tooth decay, and more than one in three kids in the county having cavities, whereas funding for childhood lead poisoning prevention programs should be sustained, whereas a continued commitment to funding and education is necessary to meet the growing mental health needs for our community, to reduce stigma related to obtaining help and improve access to mental health services, whereas public health professionals collaborate with partners outside of the public health sector, whereas efforts to adequately su support public health and prevention of disease and injury can continue to transform the health system focused on treating illness. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Black Hawk County Board of Supervisors supports the goals and ideals of public, sorry, of National Public Health Week and recognizes the efforts of local, state, and national public health professionals in protecting people from health hazards, promoting healthy behaviors, and preventing disease. Great. Thank you. That was well done. <laughs> Even quickly, so thank you. Covered a lot of good points. Any questions or comments for? No, uh, uh, just hats off to the health department for um, all the exciting events you've got planned that week. You have a reception, I think, that you've invited us to. Uh, yes, April 5th. To the 5th. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Thank you. Please answer as your name is called. Shelka? Yes. Paul? Yes. Little? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Leyland? Yes. Item 9, contracts and agreements. Resolution that the agreement received from Tyler Technologies for an electronic timekeeping system with a bid of $42,416 be approved and for the chair to sign as recommended by Al Yu, IT director. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Morning, board. Good morning. Al Yu, IT director. I apologize. I'm battling allergies <coughs> and sinuses. Um, this is the agreement for electronic timekeeping system through Tyler. Um, I ask that it be approved and for the chair to sign. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Tr Trinan has, a has had the opportunity to review the contract. Uh, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple of uh, language items we weren't, we weren't thrilled with in this contract, I will admit, but uh, it was one of those circumstances where uh, we couldn't couldn't get him to change quite everything, and the uh, L was happy with the cybersecurity language in it, and the uh, this particular application was strongly desired. So, because of that, and because of the fact that we're not aware of any cybersecurity incidents involving uh, Tyler Technology uh, products, uh, I went ahead and uh, and agreed that we could go forward with this. Thank you. This was a multi-year <coughs> contract. Uh, correct. It's a three-year contract. Three-year one. No. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Been moved and seconded. Please answer as your name is called. Hall. Yes. Little. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Velka. Yes. Aylin. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Al. Item B: Discussion possible board action. The item one is a resolution that the application for invitation to qualify for future funding to support broadband development be approved and that the county will match future broadband development, if selected, with local funds of amount to be determined, if any, and the chair be directed to sign for same. And I was going to say, I didn't know why I thought Abby mentioned being here too, but it doesn't look like she is. Yep, just me. Okay, You're stuck that's with me. Great. So that's all right. I apologize for that. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Isaiah Corbin and I represent Intercog. Uh, came to talk about the ITQ process. Um, so um, first and foremost, just to give you a little background, the OCIO has obviously been receiving quite a bit of federal funds to improve broadband. Um, and this process is a little bit different on how they have handled it in the past. So. Um, to distribute their funds, they've established these broadband intervention zones. Um, and uh, prior to this, for they've done about seven different NOFAs, 
And prior to this, they have this map, and I, I'll talk a little bit about the map uh, to come, but they've uh, put the responsibility on the providers to identify where they would like to invest money, and then they've matched it with federal funds. So obviously, when you uh, you know put the hands of broadband into providers, they typically go where the money is. Um, and so this process kind of flips it on its head a little bit and gives communities the opportunity to raise their hand that maybe haven't yet benefited from some of that broadband funding. And so uh, this ITQ, uh, first and foremost, I want to point out that it's not a grant opportunity. There is no commitment. What this uh, application does, however, is create uh, these broadband intervention zones and identifies them for the OCIO to put out for future funding. Um, so there's no commitment um, to submitting an application, um, but there's a few caveats that obviously always go along with uh, these applications and so on the second page uh, there's a list of required application materials um, and the application is relatively straightforward and relatively easy to complete as you can see there's uh, three required items that need to go into every application the cover letter which is relatively simple and basically just identifies the area and what you're focusing on the second is your eligible service location spreadsheet. So like I said, um, OCIO has this map where they've identified locations that would be considered underserved or unserved by federal standards based upon um, the number of providers they have and what services those providers provide. So. Uh, I've included a map of Blackhawk County, and this is straight from the OCIO website. And all of those little dots are households that would qualify for being unserved or underserved. And as you can see, there's a significant amount kind of in that Northeast uh, Waterloo region and then the Southeast Waterloo region. And so these eligible service location spreadsheets is what OCIO has put together this map and this mapping tool and basically allows you to draw an uh, eight mile wide circle around these areas and that would be considered your area. And so really um, you're probably looking at two, loca or two applications, two separate applications, one for the Northeast side um, between North Canfield Road and Highway 63, and then one around that Washburn, Gilbertville, Eagle Center uh, area. And so you have kind of two applications with quite a few individuals who would be considered unserved and underserved. And so um, the eligible service location spreadsheet is just simply uh, a list of those addresses pulled from the OCIO website. And then finally, uh, the last required application material is your minority impact statement, which just says it has a, does it have a negative or positive impact on uh, minority populations. Um, and the caveat comes with the optional application materials. So although they are optional, I don't really consider them optional. If you look on page three on how the ITQ is scored, um, the optional materials do hold a considerable amount of weight. Um, the, the first optional thing is just a simple narrative on how broadband impacts work, education, and health uh, for those individuals that have broadband. And um, they're pretty obvious, right? We all kind of know how broadband has impacted uh, our world since COVID and how important it uh, is for people who work from home or have a hybrid. Um, we also know on education, uh, especially those children that, you know, didn't go to school and had to do their school online during COVID and then health monitoring as we start to move toward, um, you know, telehealth and all those items. And so that's just simply a, a quick narrative. Uh, the other item is letters of community support. So obviously letters are really, really important 
Um, I kind of done, I, I have started on some of the preliminary work in terms of reaching out to, uh, for letters of support. Um, I have a letter from Grow Cedar Valley. I have a letter from the city of Gilbertville. I have a letter from Dunkerton Community School District. Um, and I've reached out a, to a couple other school districts as well as our, our two hospitals in the city of Waterloo. Um, so I've already started to kind of gather some of those letters of support because um, the application is due on Friday at 5 p.m. So that's the other thing we're working with. Um, I started talking with Linda last week. Um, you know, she, she kind of asked what this was. Um, they give you a month to do the application. So they, they open up the application on March 1st. They do a webinar about a week before and they give you a month to do it. So it's a quick turnaround. <clears throat> um, and the last two optional application materials are community broadband capital and barriers to broadband infrastructure. The barriers, again, is a narrative piece, which is relatively easy to answer um, because, you know, the way these applications look, especially in the intercog region, they're all rural areas, right? They're areas where there's not a, a large population, so there's not a large incentive for providers to go in and actually serve these because uh, doing broadband is expensive. Um, but the, the, the big caveat is the community broadband capital. Um, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit strange in terms of the application because uh, although having community broadband capital is optional, um, it's worth 24% of the application. So in my mind, it's not really optional. Um, and this uh, capital can come from a variety of ideas depending on kind of how much you want to put into it. Uh, you can, you know, write a letter that says you are willing to speed up the zoning and permitting process for any provider that wants to go into those communities and, and start uh, building out broadband. Um, it can be in kind, whether, you know, you're backfilling a ditch where they had to, you know, do some work. Um, but obviously, broadband capital, the, the big thing is cash is king. You know, it, it shows a lot to have um, some sort of cash commitment. And this is where, you know, again, it's strange because it's not a grand opportunity. You're not committing yourself to anything, but they're asking for a commitment of, you know, funds. And I've, I've talked to the OCIO about this because it, it seems strange to me I think it's strange and you know we get I've done a couple of these applications now and talked to a cu couple other county supervisors and this is always kind of the hiccup um, and what they basically told me is you know although you're committing funds you're not directly committing to those so take that for what it is I don't know what to tell you on that but I do recommend committing some sort of funds. Um, what's going to happen is once they get these applications and review them, like I said, they're just basically going on a circle radius, which doesn't always make sense when you're establishing this, these zones. So ultimately what they'll do is after they uh, grade these applications, they're going to kind of draw the zone to where it makes more sense rather than a circle. So obviously you kind of got a, a nice big grouping of individual households in your northeast and southeast uh, Waterloo side. So they'd probably redraw those. And then once they take and identify those broadband intervention zones, um, those commitments, whether it's capital or a letter uh, or something of that nature, They'll put those into the broadband intervention zones, post them, and allow providers to consider those as areas that they can intervene using some of the federal bead funding that is um, starting to come down. So um, that's an overview of the program. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, and go from there. Do you have um, any examples of the commitment amount that has been successful? So again, this is the first time. So okay, there's gotcha. no, and that's the hard part, mm -hmm. right? You don't necessarily have a project. You don't even know how much it's going to cost. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, one county committed a thousand dollars, which I think is way too low, in my personal opinion, to be competitive. Another county is committed fifteen thousand, and another is ten thousand. Um, so, uh, you know, ten to fifteen thousand, I think, is probably a good start, just because you don't necessarily know where it's going to lead to in terms of my opinion. Well, Obviously would, it can be more or less. And this would go to a provider if they should decide to, to invest in this area? Yep. Okay. So until, unless they select the, to do this project and go forward with it at some point, then that's when the commitment, while well, they're calling it not a commitment, that's when the commitment would Correct. need to be paid. Correct. Yep. Okay, and I knew, yeah, you touched on the fact that it had been anywhere from 1,000 to there was someone that did or a county that did 15? Yeah, so another county did 15. We actually had a small town of about 250 who doesn't have broadband, and they did 15 because they're really committed to it. So um, it just kind of depends, but it's a starting point, right? How many households or how many, what were the numbers that you thought were? Um, I sent that to you. I can't remember. So I think uh, if I remember off the top of my head, it was somewhere roughly between 400 and 450 for each application. Oh, for each. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> it was surprisingly a significant amount once you pull the numbers. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to provide those to you no, um, as remember. well. I was thinking 250. So yeah, so it, it was around 400 households, which obviously is a significant amount, especially when you're looking at applications in some of those smaller counties. You know, it was more around the 100 range. Um, so there, there's a good chunk of people that do not have adequate internet uh, in the county. And would this be two separate applications then? Yep, it would be two separate applications. They look the same, mm-hmm. right? All the materials are the same. So it, it really doesn't take a, a ton of effort in terms of you know submitting another application, but you do have to submit separate applications for each area. I think you'd been so kind really to offer to do both for $1,000 instead of 1000 an app. Yep, so Intercog charges $1,000 for mm-hmm. an application, you know, given that it would technically be two applications, but they're really one and the same. It doesn't take much effort to repeat those and change them as they are needed. So it would be a thousand dollars for two applications for intercog fees. And this was asked of us when we had it initially from the Dunkerton Telephone Co-op area. Yep, so um, that's what's been driving a lot of this. Um, A lot of those small providers are looking at these areas um, and kind of advocating to move forward with some of these areas that haven't been identified um, in several other counties. Dumont Telephone has kind of helped uh, lead the charge. Um, You know, so ultimately it's probably going to be some of these smaller providers that are trying to reach out that are trying to build out in some of these areas that they haven't been able to so mm-hmm. as far as the other areas in blackhawk county this is the only one that we've heard of is have you been approached by any others uh no other providers have talked to me um so um just just dunkard and obviously i i don't know i can't speak for them but i don't think they'd probably go south of raymond um you know so they're more particularly concerned with canfield in 63 but do we know um uh is this so this is fiber broadband do we know are there minimum guaranteed speeds that the companies have yeah so that's part of the federal requirements is they have to be able to provide certain speed upload download i'm not a broadband expert so i can't give you those speeds off the top of my head chris all right i know for example anything that mediacom tells you they have is is not true (laughs) yeah yep yep (laughs) yeah and that's the interesting part big problem (laughs) what And first time to yeah, I was gonna. But I mean, either one of these would be you know a multi-million dollar investment from the company to to to, to pull off, and so it's um, we go for it. I'd like to see us stand apart from the other places that have applied and and put a little bit larger amount in. The places that gave fifteen, for instance, 
Was that for both a total of 15 or was that 15 per app? Total for 15. So likely um, what OCIO has indicated is they're only going to choose one area that you submit, right? They don't want, you know, Blackhawk County to have this huge area, right? They want to spread it out. Okay. Um, so, and they're, they don't want to make sure that the areas are not contiguous. So um, they're likely only going to pick a p one. Right. So if we, you know, commit something like 30,000, you know, only one of them is going to be potentially picked. So we're not Correct. committing 60,000. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I remember you mentioning that and I had forgotten about that, thinking what if they were to pick two? Yeah. And how long? What is the timeline for this decision then so that we know? Yeah, so they're going to review all the applications in April. They'll probably put out uh, the broadband intervention zones shortly thereafter in May. So, I know that you said you know this is the first year, so you don't have really an example. But you know you've got some communities at ten thousand or ten or fifteen thousand. Do you think if we go up? To as high as a does it does it make it exponentially more likely that we'll get awarded, or do we get to some point where it's um, just sort of an excess? That's above my pay grade. I honestly, <laughs> I, I I don't have a good answer for you, Tavis. I wish I did, and you know this is the conversation that I've had with all the supervisors because I'm like I I don't know. You get you got to start somewhere, but. Um, you know, personally, I wouldn't commit, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, right? I, I mean, I would keep it pretty short and narrow, um, would be my recommendation just because you don't know what you're getting into, um, or what it could potentially lead to. So, and for the most part, I think these have been ARPA dollars for some of these projects. Yeah. Prior to this, it's been mostly ARPA dollars. This will, uh, the future going forward, it will be through the bead funding, the bead program through the federal government. Um, so that's where a lot of the state's funds are going to come from is through that program. And so they'll do some work on the back end. You know, there's some equity pieces that are also part of that, that the state is responsible for pulling and uh, addressing because that's part of the requirements with the bead funding through the federal program. Obviously, the success of it's what we'd like to right. see, but yeah, I'm yeah. Saying, no, that's not. I mean, I'll I'll offer a, a a motion to approve the application for innovation to qualify for future funding uh, for both of these locations um, with a local funds commitment of um, twenty five thousand. So. Second that. Where would that money be coming from? Reserves? Uh, yeah, or reserves. Arpa? Reserves. Could come from either, though, correct? Right. It could come could from come. either, potentially. And also, we do have, um, we did budget for those agency allocations. So maybe, potentially, oh. you could choose to use that if you wanted to. <laughs> I think you have several options. <laughs> Didn't he indicate that he doesn't need a dollar amount at this time, just a commitment? Yes, I was going to say. I would need a dollar amount. The um, commitment. Yeah. But not the cash. <clears throat> not the cash. Yeah, I don't need a check. I just need a resolution, a commitment, and I will put that in the application. So, so does that mean $25,000 for any uh, application that's approved, or we're saying $25,000 25, for each of the two zones? or For each of the two zones. With only with one it. being selected, though. Yeah, yeah. So 25,000 total. Only one would be, so 25 total. Comments, questions? I support, not the, but not the amount. Well, I wonder if we can come down a little. I think we're at 62.50, right? That, that, that's what it comes down to. We got 400, 400 households that are impacted, 62.50 per household. That's a, that's a, that, to me, it feels like a pretty sensible investment to help make sure that these folks have broadband and make sure that we're 
we are the, the we're leaders here, right? Uh, and we've got access, whether it's through reserves or whether it's through ARPA, to make sure that we can we can cover that. It's not exponentially high. So, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with the number if if it needs to in order to gain support, but I'm comfortable at, at 25. Mm -hmm. I'm sold. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments or questions, Tom? No, I think it's a great program. I have a little concern on taking it out of the reserves. Sure. Well, we can, yeah, to be determined, I guess we can look at that later then, if that's all right. Okay. We won't designate that. So did we have a motion and a second? I can't yep. recall. We did. All right. Uh, if no further discussion, please answer as your name is called. Little. <clears throat> Little. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Drelka. Yes. Hall. Yes. Leyland. Yes. So item number two of this discussion of possible board action is a resolution that the chair be authorized to sign a memorandum of understanding with the uh, intercog for the development and submission of the ITQ application at a cost of $1,000. So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. If there's no discussion. Please answer as your name is called. Schwartz. Yes. Drelka. Yes. Hall. Yes. Little. Yes. Leyland. Yes. So my re last request, yep. uh, get letters of support to me, um, if you can, by Friday. Um, I will submit the application on Friday by 5 o'clock. <clears throat> um, so the more letters, the better. Um, like I said, I, I have reached out to school districts, economic development, uh, the county hospitals. Um, but any residents, yourselves as individual supervisors, um, would be much appreciated. Any businesses. Um, and I'll take those and put those in the application. And you want a letter for each one of the areas, right? I know yes. we can basically write the same. Yeah, you can just write the same letter. What are, you re what are we referring to each of the kind of zones as? Yeah, so I, I have referred to uh, um, the northeast and southeast, basically. Okay. Yeah. If you want to <coughs> forward a sample. Yeah, and I can I can forward you samples um, because they have they already have boilerplate language, um, so. Mm. And I think Dunkerton was going to work on that as well, maybe? Yep. Uh, I got a letter from Dunkerton Communications as well. I got one from the school district, Dunkerton School District. I reached out to Denver School District. Haven't heard from them. I reached out to the Waterloo School District. Uh, Carrie at Grow Cedar Valley gave me a letter. Um, I'm still waiting on Allen and uh, Mercy One. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaiah. This has been the Isaiah meeting. Yeah. yeah, it has. It's been mentioned yeah, <laughs> numerous times. <laughs> Item number 10 is a resolution to approve the purchase of a van for the health department's oral health program with an estimated cost of $48,346 to be paid for with ARPA funds. So moved. Second. second. And moved and seconded. Is there any comments or anything anybody wants to say? We'll just move forward. <laughs> anything, Mike? Uh, I'd, I'd just add that uh, this was evaluated for el eligibility, um, and it was deemed eligible. I'm looking, well, I'm looking for the page that tells us the category. Bear with me. It's deemed eligible as six. enumerated capital projects under one million dollars, which we—that's the sixth level up, as Mr. Little just mentioned. Great. Well, if there are no further questions, I know this is for the purchase. We've probably looked at all of it. I know that uh, a representative from the health department is here. If there are any questions about what the van would be used for, <laughs> anybody have questions or comments right. over? <laughs> oh, number one county for tooth decay. Yeah. This yeah. is a good thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sure is. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Please answer as your name is called. Trelka. Yes. All. Yes. Little. Yes. <laughs> yes. Raven. Yes. Item B, resolution to submit to Baker Tilly for ARPA eligibility evaluation, the Veterans Affairs proposed shelter project with a projected cost of $110,000. I'll move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Anyone wish to speak to this? Please. <clears throat> I'm Heidi Warrington, 525 Martin Road in Waterloo, and I'm the chair of the Black Hawk County Veterans Affairs Commission. Well, this is a double joy 
because not only does this project really significantly help our veterans who once a week from April through October have a community meal that's served, and we have different agencies that pay for those meals and come. We have an average of 70 to 100 veterans that typically attend that. Um, that's our networking. But the double joy is when you look at the public health department that's co-located at this building and you look at human to human airborne transmitted infections like COVID is the most recent example, having an outdoor place that is secure from the weather has a wheelchair accessibility, has electricity and stuff. We could do outdoor screening for mass outbreaks. We have a cooking kitchen um, that's inside that door that we could do mass feedings outside. There's even room in our area there if we had to do mass sheltering actually with tentage that we could support the public health department. That's not the Veterans Affair mission, but we're looking for a win-win to look at um, those two agencies augmenting each other as far as a capability. Um, and it's an ideal location. It will stay an ideal location. So subject to your questions. No, I think it's a great project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Heidi. It's been moved and seconded. Please answer as your name is called. Paul. Yes. Little. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Joka. Yes. Aylin. Yes. Item C, motion that the appointment of Griffin Kabalka of 2023 Blackhawk County Weed Commissioner be approved as recommended by Catherine Nicholas, Cal I'll Engineer. Move. Second. And moved and seconded. I'll, I'll go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, <laughs> as you know, uh, every year the, the Code of Iowa dictates that the Board of Supervisors of each county appoint a weed commissioner. We are transitioning to our new roadside a veg vegetation biologist, Griffin Kabalka. He will be the uh, weed commissioner for the foreseeable future. So I'd recommend his approval. Thank you. Let's get the official title. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I would okay, just like please. to add, no. if you had any questions about that or any at all during this time um, and throughout the year, just let me know. Um, I would like to say too that P forgot to say this at the beginning, um, that uh, it's kind of a, a nice thing to do for the community as well, um, to send out a spring memo every year, um, especially with, you know, concerns of herbicide is always just something that people have concerns about, especially the people with sensitive crops like um, arborys, bees, um, organic farms, um, mm -hmm. livestock, children, things like that. Um, so will we be sending out um, a memo stating in the paper just through our department what we're going to be applying and um, on our website we'll have the full memo, um, the full spring memo as well as um, the chemical, um, the herbicide uh, labels so people if they need or want to know more about it that's there for their, um, for their fun reading. <laughs> and also this year we're going to be kind of a rough draft this year, um, doing a no spray policy um, for those sensitive crop areas. Um, just being there for you know every type of application of citizen and what their livelihood and everything is. Um, and this just basically entails that they would select an area where um, they don't want the county to be spraying in the right of way. And then I will go out there, evaluate the site to make sure that it's a justifiable area and um, with that, then we give the citizen um, the ability to uh, manage the weeds. And then as weed commissioner, if I see the infestation or anything like that, um, you know, I go through my normal process of, you know, here's two weeks notice, like you need to take care of this. Um, and, then, and then if no action is taken, then, then I continue forth with eradicating those weeds. Mm -hmm. So that's just a rough um, draft for this year, but I think next year it would be good to get a county policy and application process done for for this no spray policy. That's good. Any questions? No, thank you. Sounds like a good thank idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, then moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. Congratulations. <laughs> Resolution that each owner and each person in possession of control of any land of unincorporated Blackhawk County shall be herbicide sprayed, cut, 
burn, or otherwise destroy all noxious weeds thereon, as defined in these chapters. At such time in each year and such manner as said prevents as said lands free from such growth of any other weeds as shall render the streets or highways adjoining said land unsafe for public travel. Noxious weeds shall be cut or otherwise destroyed on or before June 1, 2023, and as often thereafter after, as necessary to prevent said production and direct the publication of the notice in official newspapers of Black Hawk so County. Moved. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. If there are no further questions or comments, please answer as your name is called. Little? Yes. Short? Yes. Jelka? Yes. Paul? Yes. Layman? Yes. Item E, motion that the personnel requisition for an office specialist full-time in the treasurer's office be approved as recommended by Linda Hintzman, treasurer. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. <coughs> um, is there any questions or comments for Linda? Otherwise, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion's carried. Item 11, any reports or information from the board? In regard to consolidated dispatch, Mm -hmm. Many people are surprised at the cost, and the cost increases every year. This is an important function of our community, but it's a very complex problem. Uh, however, many people are involved in trying to find a solution, because uh, we owe it to our taxpayers to not only provide them a service, but to provide them services at the cost that will see our taxes increase at a substantial rate every year. We just hope we can find a solution. And they're working at doing that. So yes. Thank you. For thanks, for, thanks for working on that, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else come before the board? Um, you know, just a uh, little report from the uh, public health board meeting that they did earlier this month, passed their, their updated well regulations that will be coming to the board, um, to the full board, should be adopted as a as an ordinance. So. That's right. Thank you. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Aye.